Hello friends and metrics, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks for asking. <laughs> All right, um, let us have a look at this physical science paper one uh, during these May June exams. Okay, so I downloaded this paper from this website. Is it stanmorephysics.com? So you can go and get yourself a copy there. So they kind of branded this paper. So there are some darker areas, but I hope we will be able to see through them and be able to do what we need to do. All right, guys, uh, let's not waste any time and jump right into it because we will try and move as fast as possible. Okay. Let me just get myself a nice uh, pen to work with and then yeah all right so this was the May June exams 2022 physical science paper one the national senior certificate exams at SA all right so let's have a look and see what is going on so download it from Stanmore physics so you can go and get yourself a copy there of this paper so I'm not gonna go through the instructions well already passed a question why <clears throat> all right guys you know the drill you know the general rules and all that so we're not gonna go through that so but please whenever you handle a paper make sure you have a look at those things but I tend to pay more special attention to local rules and regulations you know terms and conditions <clears throat> so here it says various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions each question has only one correct answer okay choose so believe me sometimes they do have a tendency to put two but yeah at most it's going to be one choose the answer and write only the letter a to d okay so next to the question number of course that is the story so in any case here even if some things look related but the most correct is what is the answer okay don't choose the least correct all right so let's have a look so unfortunately this thing is a nightmare so i don't know if you can see it so question 1.1 reads a bucket okay is at rest on a table okay so 1.1 says a bucket, it's a pit now, this little thing here is sitting over the writing. So a bucket is at rest on a table. So it says which one of the following is the reaction force, okay? Now pay attention to keywords folks because if you get this right, you won't struggle. So now it says um, which one of the following is the reaction force? to the weight of the bucket okay as described by newton's third law do you see the third law all right so we know that third law is all about action and reaction okay that is the word action and reaction so for every action there's going to be an equal in measure of the reaction but oppositely directed that's wrong okay now let's have a look so the first statement says force of the table on earth that is not because the force of the table on earth is the weight okay of that table so it has nothing to do with the bucket because the question is about the bucket on a table so the force of the table on earth is the weight so that option a is out force of the bucket on earth that's a weight of the bucket okay force of the bucket on the table still is going to be the weight okay but the force of the table on the bucket is definitely the reaction which is what we would call a normal force in this case so this one is easy so that is the story so if you think about it this is what you have if this is your duffel over here then there is the bucket okay, of water, right? 
So what you will have is going to be the weight of the bucket on the table, okay? And the normal force is going to be the force of the table on the bucket, okay? So that is the reaction force or normal force. So easy one there. So the first question here is D, okay? Next question says, um, I oh, know it looks a bit distant. Let's just bring it a bit closer. Okay. <clears throat> now here it says a ball is dropped from a height above the ground. Okay. So this is now vertical projectile motion. Okay. Now it says ignore a resistance. That means think of a situation like an isolated system where there are no external forces and essentially there is more of a vacuum-like situation, all right? Okay, so it says now the following pairs show physical quantities associated with the ball while it is falling to the ground, okay? Physical quantities. Now, what do you know about physical quantities? We have scalar quantities where it's just a physical quantity with just magnitude. But we have vector quantities which is magnitude as well as direction all right so let's see what are they talking about now so they're saying the following pairs show physical quantities associated with the ball while it is falling to the ground it says now in which one of these pairs will both remember not just one both again as i said pay attention to local restrictions it says which one of these pairs will both quantities change? Okay, so these ones are changing while the ball is falling, okay? So we want stuff that changes, but both of them, not just one of them, because sometimes when you're given a pair situation and they're telling you both, that means you want a pair that is going to be both quantities changing and not just one, all right? So let's see, mechanical energy and weight. We know the weight doesn't change, right? We know that mechanical energy, when we are talking about ignore effects of air resistance, basically we're talking about an isolated system here. Okay, which is more like a vacuum. I don't know what is, va vacuum is written what? I don't know. Sometimes I forget the spellings, you know. <clears throat> been a while since I worked on them so in an isolated system we know that total mechanical energy is conserved right because we say energy cannot be created not destroyed but it is just converted from one form to the next when the ball is at its very top it has a high potential <clears throat> energy which essentially equates to the total mechanical energy and at the bottom when it moves it has a maximum velocity so it will have a maximum kinetic energy and minimum mechanical energy, I mean, sorry, minimum potential energy, but the total mechanical energy remains the same. So these two don't change. Kinetic energy and momentum, let's think about it. What is kinetic energy? Is EK, right? And what is momentum? Is the rate of change. Okay, let's not talk about a rate of change but when we talk of momentum it's still a vector quantity so both of the, okay this is a scalar quantity this is a vector quantity but now let's have a look at momentum so you have a ball here they said it's dropped from a small height so let's say this is the height above the ground and this ball is being dropped down we know here that the EP is maximum right and it equates to the mechanical energy okay because the kinetic energy here at the top ek is zero all right but at the bottom we know that ek is maximum and it equates to the mechanical energy essentially and we know that ep here potential energy is zero now that means as it falls down to the ground it gains kinetic energy so kinetic energy has a major change maximum versus minimum so kinetic energy does change for sure greatly what about momentum we know that momentum is mv okay it has something to do with velocity and as we gain kinetic energy we gain velocity 
and if we gain velocity the momentum remember it was zero at the beginning but here it's going to be maximum so momentum will also change okay so basically this is the best answer but let's have a look at the others uh, what is this gravitational acceleration and kinetic energy why we know that this one definitely does change definitely but gravitational acceleration is the same so it does not change so this pair because of gravitational acceleration is not the correct one because they said both quantities change okay gravitational potential energy and gravitational force well we know gravitational potential energy will definitely change because it has its max at the top and it is zero at the bottom so that definitely does change but what about gravitational force gravitational force does not change so the only thing that changes there is the energy so that again is not the best combination so our answer is B okay so we are happy with that one so pretty easy so again you need to have a bit of an understanding of you know some very basic concepts because honestly these things are not really that difficult but yeah they can be a challenge at times now let's look at 1.3 1.3 says a ball is dropped from a height h and strikes the floor with momentum p ignore a resistance so this is more or less the similar question as above it says now the ball is now dropped from a height that is double the height which was the initial height now it says which one of the following represents the momentum with which the ball now strikes the floor now this is not an easy question so this is more of a, a dangerous question i would put this one as a higher grade type question okay so now let's have a look what is the story here first of all when we're talking momentum we know that momentum equals mass multiplied by velocity and because of velocity it becomes a vector quantity now let's have a look at what is happening here in the first instance so we know here that the total mechanical energy so what we can say here um, ek bottom equals ep top okay this is the law of conservation of mechanical energy right because once it has something to do with the height when we want a velocity we want to think of the energy systems all right or you can even use falling bodies it's still okay but we want a hypothetical situation so we don't want to cause ourselves a lot of problems now if you think about this thing in terms of momentum or vertical momentum okay say mechanical energy so we know that ek is half mv squared okay equals the potential energy at the top is mgh okay great now what do we want we want the velocity right so when we want the velocity we simply divide by um, half m half of m so that goes so we remain with v squared equals what so this one flips about into the top but this one takes the m away so all we end up with is 2 g h therefore we know that v is going to be the square root of 2 g h great so this is our velocity so what does it tell us about the momentum then in this case this follows that our momentum is going to be the mass which is m we'll just take it as m multiplied by the velocity which is going to be the square root of 2 g h okay so this is how the momentum works out in this first scenario okay so we know that well p is m multiplied by the square root of 2 g h i hope that makes a little bit of sense all right 
Now let's have a look in this second scenario. So this kind of a question is not one you just walk through and it's over. So the next one here, we're going to say fine, since we know what is going on in here. So already, okay, let's just work it out nice and easy so that we don't cause any trouble. So we can say EK bottom equals EP top. Again, this is the conservation of mechanical energy situation, okay, involving vertical motion. Not a problem. So half mv squared equals, here, yeah, it's going to be mgh. But now in this case, this one is still the same. It's half mv squared equals, but now the h is twice, so it's going to be twice mgh, okay, because of 2h. So this will just multiply in front. So this is going to be the situation, right? Right, which follows what? That we divide by half m. I'm just prolonging this one so that you can follow. V squared equals, now when you flip this one, it's going to be essentially two times, that two is going to multiply. I'm going to break it this way because it's easy to just make it four, but four is going to hurt you. Okay. Um, uh, GH, sorry, because M will cancel GH, okay? Now remember, you want something that looks like that. That's why I'm not multiplying the 2 to get a 4. So this is why this question is not very obvious, because you can easily make 4 and then take the square root of 4, and then you run into problems, you know? Because what is the velocity? Is the square root of 2GH multiplied by M. Now here it follows that v is going to be the square root of 2 times 2gh, okay? Great. Now we just want to express this velocity properly. So what does this tell us? Well, all it tells us is that we will have, you split this like you would in sets, right? So this is like a more mathematical tricky thing multiplied by the square root of 2gh. The reason I am splitting it like that, you could easily say 4, square root of 4 is 2, but it doesn't really bring out the best answer. So it's better to do it this way. Okay, so that is V in essence. Now, what will this give us? The momentum P is going to be M multiplied by the velocity. But now this new velocity is going to be M multiplied by the square root of 2 times the square root of uh, 2GH which you can just put this in front, this is square root of 2 multiplied by m multiplied by the square root of 2gh, okay? But now what did we say m multiplied by square root of 2gh is? It equals to p. So this whole thing is going to boil down to just square root of 2 multiplied by p because that you proved that it was p. So it was not a very easy question, so that is the answer there, root 2p. So the answer is B. Okay. So some questions, uh, unfortunately, will chow a bit of your time. They are designed for that. So that they can, you know, mess with your time a little bit. So I hope you can see some of the workings that I've had to do there. So uh, that is the story. So it would be easy to make a mistake of thinking this one or that one. So if you work it out nicely, you will know what is expected of you. Okay, hope you enjoyed that part because these are the fun parts of the question. So now it says, um, object X exerts a gravitational force F on object Y when the distance between their centers is R. So we know for a fact that, ah, let's say this is object X and then this is object Y and then we know that the distance between their centers is R. So it follows from Newton's law of universal gravitation that we're going to have this m1, m2 over R squared. Okay. So that's what we're going to have. I think this is what is going on in here. So it's not a problem. So we know that what is the definition of F here? It is g m1 multiplied by m2 R squared. That's it. So that is the force. Again, this is one of those questions 
which are a little bit higher than what would be standard. All right, so it says now R is doubled. Okay, so what does this bring? It brings us a new scenario. Again, this question is designed to chow your time. So now F is going to be given by, of course, universal gravitation, M1, it, nothing has changed about that. M2 is still the same. You can say MX, MY, maybe. It's up to you. I mean, really, there's no big deal. But now we're doubling the distance, so this is going to be 2R. And then you square. Don't get caught out and just say 2 and then you square the R. Remember, the R was actually everything inside its bracket squared. So what do we have here? G multiplied by M1, M2 over 2 squared is 4R squared. Now, what does this tell us? If you just take out a common factor because we want to define our force here. Common factor is 1 over 4 into you think about this one, this is G times M1 times M2 over R squared. And what was that? That we said was F above, so this is essentially F. So it means this force is, um, I don't what we, we can say it's quartered. <laughs> it's cut in quarters. So meaning the force becomes weaker. As you can see, these things, when they're moved apart, the force becomes smaller but when they are moved closer together the force increases okay so in essence what is the answer again this is more of a calculative type of a thing you can't just look at it and guess it but if you can work it out in your mind faster then you would know that ah this is the answer so 1.4 is a because now it says which one of the following represents the gravitational force that x now exerts on y so it's going to be multiplied by a quarter, so it's going to be made by a factor of 1 over 4, right? So that is the story. Again, questions that are not there for you to just guess, but they need you to work out some things hypothetically, okay? Hope you enjoyed that one too. Um, it's cool. Let's move on. All right, so 1.5 says A force F moves an object P from point X, which is over there at rest, right, to point Y along two different paths. Now remember, once you hear this kind of a thing that has to do with paths, you have to decide, is this a conservative force or is it a non-conservative force? You know that a non-conservative force does work on an object depending on the path taken by that object, okay? But a conservative force does the amount of work irrespective of the path taken, okay? Now it says, all right, we can see here, ah, these two paths are a little bit different, but they take us to the same point. Now it says, uh, the work done by F in moving the object is the same. Now hear that. The work done by F is the same for both paths, okay? So that means this one is more of a conservative force because the work that it does is the same irrespective of the path taken. So this is a conservative force and one major conservative force is gravitational force, okay? Friction, air resistance, uh, applied forces, they are all examples of non-conservative, so this definitely should be gravity. Which one of the following can be used to describe force F? Is it a normal force? Well, because this one is often taken for a force that opposes gravity, right? Isn't it? Yes, we agree with that. But here's the problem with the normal force. Once you hear the word normal, let's say we had a slope. Let's say we have two different parts. One is horizontal. Of course, you put an object, the weight is down, the normal force is exactly equal to the weight, okay? So whatever amount of work the weight is doing is going to be the same as the amount of work that the normal force has done. And we know once the angle uh, between the direction of motion, be it left or right, if it is perpendicular, so a force that is perpendicular to the direction of motion does zero work, and that is the case here. 
but we have a bit of a situation here because now the weight is down like that but there would be sort of like a vertical component so normal force is going to be that force but this force is not going to be equal to the weight it's going to be smaller than the weight all right and you can tell already here that this one if the movement is up and down that one does no work okay in this case but the weight is at an angle to this motion so its horizontal component is the one that's doing work so it's going to do some work via its uh, sorry parallel component or horizontal component of the weight so uh, this one is not the best fit because depending on the path uh, things can change around so oh, let's just not uh, feature this one so it's a weak one but I mean it still does zero irrespective of the path right because it's always perpendicular but here's the issue uh, let's not talk too much about it uh, I think it's a bit vague it's not really conservative tension force um, tension is anything that is applied so it's not conservative it will depend on the path taken frictional force again but gravitational force is the best one because we know this one it doesn't care which direction you are taking it just does the same amount of work if there's no other forces included gravitational force will be the dominant force that will just do the same amount of work as it would do anywhere else all right so basically that is where we go with this situation so I don't know. A, it's not very clear. I mean, even trying to explain it here sometimes is like saying the same thing because you're like, yeah, but the double force here is actually not at play because it's just doing no work. But what about the horizontal component? So do you see, it's, 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 it's a bit technical because this part is doing work because the weight is doing work in this case. But you see, it's not like that pair both not doing work but one is not other one is so a bit of a shaky situation but let's just stick to this guy we know this is a conservative force weight will always be weight no matter where you are no matter how you're going about it all right so i would go for um d okay but it's one of those questions that yeah can be a bit of a situation now it says, uh, which one of the following can be explained by the Doppler effect, okay? Now, when you say explained, um, that means, will it be valid to apply the principles of the Doppler effect in that given situation? Let's see. A stethoscope is used to listen to a person's heartbeat. Look, here's the thing. Because the heart is stationary, all right? Remember, when we're talking Doppler effect, there has to be a relative motion between the source and the listener. Now, with the stethoscope, you are stationary as a doctor, and you're placing it on the chest, and the heart is not moving away from you, it's just sitting there, okay? The only thing that's moving is blood, but the stethoscope does not measure blood movement or blood, should I say, um, the velocity of blood or blood flow. It can tell about the quality of the flow. For example, if there is a narrowing in the heart valves, then there are some sounds that are going to be transmitted in some areas. So, for example, if the mitral valve is sort of... Um, oh God, why am I talking about this? But anyway, let's just talk about it because they brought in a medical instrument. So, let's just go for it. So, if the mitral valve is stenosed, be it from an infection, like people who use drug, um, who inject drugs, they tend to inject bugs into their bloodstream and it tends to affect the hearts, a condition that we call um, infective endocarditis. So that can affect the mitral valve and scar it such that it does not become competent. Maybe at times it can become stenosed, at times it can just become incompetent, but the issue is there will be a sound that says there's a problem in the mitral valve and that is listened to in the apex of the heart so that is almost around the left nipple okay so one would place a stethoscope there and hear a sound but mind you 
the sound is going to be the same depending on where you place the stereoscope it doesn't change because that heart is not moving away it's just standing there and just beating like a drum so no this one doesn't work because Doppler effect has to do with some sort of motion so the frequency is going to be the same the heart the way it beats you're going to hear the same frequency of course if then you start messing up with the heart like you start scaring the person and the heart races that's the only time you're going to hear any increment in terms of the frequency of the heartbeat but remember the heart it's still standing there so even if that increases it will increase and whatever level you're going to get is exactly that level so there won't be like a change like the heart is approaching and then it passes and then something changes no it will change in the same way basically yo i spent too much on this one i don't know why anyway an echo is heard when sound waves are reflected off a cliff well echo again look there is no particular movement it's just a movement of the air okay so yes you can hear that uh, but it has nothing to do because i mean whatever is reflected the frequency is going to be the same so nothing is going to change so ugh, this one is not really cool now it says the spectrum of light from an approaching star hear that approaching that means there's motion here okay and there is an observation relative to motion that is an application of Doppler effect okay a spectrum of light from an approaching star is shifted hear that towards the shorter wavelengths so what is the shorter wavelength it's a blue shift I'm gonna write it red but it's a blue shift so we call this one a blue shift of the spectrum when it goes to the longer wavelengths it's a red shift so shorter wavelengths means blue and that means that star is coming towards earth okay and definitely there's an application in this case because remember wavelengths are related to frequency we know that the speed uh, of light sometimes they call it c or v equals um, frequency multiplied by the lambda which represents the wavelength and these two are interchangeable in that when you want frequency you say speed divide by the wavelength when you want wavelength so these ones are inversely related so essentially they function in the same place at times so this one is yes definitely this can be explained by the Doppler effect because there's a relative motion and a, a, an apparent change in the observation remember the star is the same nothing has changed about the star and its quality but because of its motion relative to earth and the frequencies involved we tend, we tend to see more than we do when it's far away so those are the things uh, I think cannot overly emphasize what is so this one is correct let's see sound intensity nope we're talking frequency not intensity so it says sound intensity decreases when the sound source moves away uh, from a stationary listener hmm hey, this one is a bit tricky but let me just tell you for example if we're talking intensity we're talking about the amplitude of the wave okay so this is what you would say it's an intense wave let's say um, you can see the amplitude and then for the same frequency can you see the amplitude is shorter so intensity has some relation to do with the amplitude but it has nothing to do with the frequency the frequency is the same you will see that also some equations that relate intensity with frequency you take the square of the frequency on the other side but remember the frequency is the same but you're just squaring it that means you are amplifying the quality of the sound but the quality which is the pitch is related directly with the frequency okay directly with the frequency the intensity is just that very same frequency but augmented sort of that means a higher amplitude but same frequency so you understand that right so no not intensity but frequency intensity is related mostly directly with the amplitude but not frequency frequency is the same so this is what would catch a student because it'd be like yeah but it's not about intensity we're talking about the quality of the sound which is the pitch 
we're not talking about the loudness of the sound we're talking about the quality of that sound all right so I think here the best answer wow what did I do here my lord that is not the answer <laughs> I was just trying to explain this but I mistakenly the answer is the red one right so that is the answer so the answer here is C again that's not a very easy question uh, but it's a question that you can handle so please not A I was just explaining A but the answer is this one okay at times these two can mess with you but if we're saying an echocardiogram in measuring blood flow yes it uses Doppler effect okay but an echo is just a reflection of sound it has nothing to do with the changing of frequency it's just reflection okay normal the nature of a wave it can be reflected it can be refracted can be diffracted you know so things like that so uh, let's not go there we're gonna start another topic altogether all right 1.7 says uh, two oppositely charged um, uh, point charges oppositely charged so you know that if you have oppositely charged spheres let's say this one is positive and that one is negative they will have a force of attraction between their centers right it's an attraction so know that this is not repulsion this is attraction okay either way whether it was repulsion or attraction the concept is the same which one of the following is correct it says now the point charges move at constant velocity mm, look that's not true because when you say constant velocity you mean there's no resultant force and that's not true there is a force and if there is a force then that force will cause acceleration because we know that Newton's second law says the resultant force is related to the mass and acceleration so anyway it's not going to be constant velocity because there's no other force opposing this okay of course we assume that there's no resistance between these two in terms of the air resistance or whatever else would be in between here so decreasing velocity no it won't decrease because the reality is as they move closer we could see here on question Let me just check here what was that question that so we calculated the force when we manipulate the distance we could see here that when we move this feather apart the force weakens okay you could see we got a quarter there instead of just f we got a quarter of f so the distance has some change to the force quality and if you're changing the force which would be the resultant force so essentially no uh, the, 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 the velocity cannot be decreased of course maybe it could be decreasing if we were moving these further apart but because these are attracting the force gets stronger and stronger as they come closer together so the velocity will increase because as the force increases acceleration increases if acceleration increases the rate of change of velocity also increases so these ones are going to move much faster so mm -mm, not going to work constant acceleration no because this force is not constant all right it's not constant it may be the same force between the two but as they move closer once you manipulate that distance the force gets stronger and we know light charges are going to come together so the distance will continue to narrow and that means the force becomes much more stronger if it becomes much more stronger the acceleration becomes also directly increased as the force is increasing by the same rate and therefore the answer here becomes the increasing acceleration because the force also increases as they come closer together all right so that is easy again Newton's second law coupled with um, Newton's uh, law of universal gravitation okay guys uh, let's just move and finish this because I would like to get to some of those long lengthy questions before we waste too much time here don't want to take longer than is necessary okay 1.8 says which one of the following phrases describes the emf so that is the electromotive force 
or the force or potential difference that moves charge through the circuit but remember this one is the potential of the cell before charge flows in the circuit so there's no current so remember that is the maximum potential energy when there is no current flowing in the circuit but this is the potential of that battery but as soon as it starts driving this it's no longer that potential but it's actually now the force that is actually moving so it just say the voltage all right so it says now the energy supplied per unit charge so you know almost when we talk of energy per once you hear that word it means division so potential difference is what they are saying energy supplied um by the way power man when you say per unit time so you know that energy is work over time so that is power so that interpretation is the description of power and not emf okay charge transferred per unit time now you know that coulomb's law says um, one coulomb equals one ampere uh, in one second across a poten i mean a cross sectional space so they'll say a charge of one coulomb when a current of one ampere uh, crosses a cross sectional area in the circuit or conductor in one second so q equals it now when we say charge transferred per unit because remember this represents charge so this follows that now q over t equals the current okay so basically here charge transferred per unit time is a definition of a current so not the emf okay the current supplied per unit charge well the current supplied per unit charge doesn't really make sense now because look what are we doing here now we're just taking this and dividing by that and then this would tell us we're going to get one over t so i mean it does not make that much of a sensible description that we can put any name to it i don't think there is a law that can be explained by that description so for me that's just gibberish it's just there to confuse you maximum energy supplied per unit charge yes 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 that's the potential difference okay that's the potential difference because we know here that w is equal to vq right there is a formula like that let me just check and be sure sometimes um my mind forgets some of these things man you know i mean i've not really been doing this for a while now so in a way um I tend to forget some of these things. Um, uh, yes, there it is. But now they did it. See, it's work over charge. So that is the one. So uh, if you think about it, now the EMF was saying maximum because this can define any potential difference per se. But once you use the word maximum, this is when there is no current flowing per se so this is now the potential so if you divide by charge here work per, per charge it defines a voltage but that word maximum describes what would be an emf is the total voltage before any current is flowing through the circuit so the answer there is d for 1.8 okay now the graph below represents the output voltage versus time for an AC generator. Okay, great. Now we know all of that. All right, so we can see that the amplitude is 200. That tells us about our Vmax. So the maximum voltage here that we're getting is 200 volts. Okay. And then of course, once you see this in terms of time, this represents the period, the time it takes to complete a cycle. So what is the period is the space between any two successive points that are in phase in a wave now when we say successive points then we are just trying to say look if you saw this as a starting point when is the next wave apparently looking like it's starting it's over there so it's going to be from here to there okay 
so it's going to be from here to there so that is what would be the period or if you want when you say points in phase you can take the amplitudes together again you will see that this is exactly halfway between these two points that one and that one so that could still be or the troughs you can either use the peaks or the troughs or you can use the starting points of each wave okay so don't make a mistake of taking it from here this is just half cycle think of it as a sine graph half cycle another half cycle making a full cycle okay all right uh, what am i saying here now it says okay the graph uh, below represents the output uh, voltage versus time for an ac generator again if you think about this question the reason why i'm trying to show you this guys is because i've noted that um, your exams they tend to repeat some of the things i mean we saw this uh, this exact calculation but this one was rather directly asked instead of um, asked in the MCQs like this they gave you a graph and then they changed a few things and then they wanted you to draw a new graph same do you see they brought it back same concept so there will be some repeats that's why I'm saying to you the most recent exam has a very strong bearing on the quality of the paper you're going to get in the just next exam so please make sure you revise this paper as well and then of course try to take it out and try it out and then have a look and see what you can get so now it says fine uh, the speed of rotation of the generator's coil is now doubled again they talked about doubling the speed of the rotation of the coil and remember when you're changing the speed of that coil the magnetic flux also changes as fast as it is so we know that from Faraday's law, EMF equals uh, minus N to just change, to talk about the change in direction that it's opposite and all that. I mean, that N talks about that the magnetic flux is going in the opposite direction to, you know, the motion whatsoever. But basically, what is that sign again? Uh, it's the rate of change. They write this thing over delta t okay that means magnetic flux okay so if we are changing this we're doubling this thing here remember emf is directly proportional to this magnetic flux change then this just tells you about the direction of that change that's all so all we are saying is if we're doubling this we are directly doubling the emf so in essence we're going to get the peak at 200 I mean at 400 this time around the peak goes to 400 okay great um, that is the change that we're going to get in terms of the EMF remember you are dealing with this graph so they want you to experience this change now what happens to the frequency remember once you double the speed you are increasing the frequency because we know C is equal to frequency multiplied by the wavelength so if you increase the frequency for the same wavelength I mean or maybe the wavelength will change for sure but all I know is that this is directly related to the frequency and frequency has some relation with the period because we don't really pay attention to that now here the reason we are doing this is because we know eventually that the period is equal to the inverse of the frequency okay so these things they are linked man they will push you around if you don't understand how they work together so basically if we're doubling the speed of this coil that means we're doubling the frequency right and if we're doubling the frequency what are we doing to the period we are halving it because we are saying the inverse of the frequency is that so if we're doubling the frequency this is 2f so what are we doing to the period we are actually halving it so the period is going to be half that means to do a complete cycle is going to be half of 0 comma 0 4 and half of 0 comma 0 4 is 0 comma 0 2 that means here now we're going to be completing a cycle so what we're going to end up with is a situation where let's just see half of this one 0 comma 0 4 divide by 2 is 0 comma 0 2 so that now becomes our new period okay 
and then that one divide by 2 becomes here at 0, 0,01 which is half of that that's when I'm going to be getting half of my cycle so all I'm going to get a new graph is going to look like this it goes to 400 cuts here and then comes here and then of course continues in that direction but all I'm saying is the new peak is going to be a quarter of this right right and then the half cycle is going to be a half of that right a full cycle is going to be this one which itself is a half of that old period so this is what we're going to end up with so now it says which one of the following combinations below show the correct new peak output voltage and the time for one rotation one rotation is just one cycle or one complete wave okay so what are we going to say now well the period we can see now has changed to 0, 0,2 all right what about the amplitude? The amplitude has doubled to 400. So let's see, where is that combination? A, because that voltage output goes to 400. The new period is 0, 0,02. So that is the best answer for us. Because the rest, it doesn't change the amplitude. So not a candidate at all because of the amplitude. Because the amplitude cannot be the same for these two but maybe you would want to say okay what if it becomes smaller no it won't it only becomes smaller if you are halving the speed of rotation all right not a problem um let's just do the last one i don't know i took forever now i wasn't planning to but hey it's always nicer to explain so that you understand that these things are not really far-fetched they are based on exactly the principles in your textbooks. Now 1.10 says a photon of light energy 2 times x joules okay, is shown onto a metal surface with work function of x joules. Okay. Alright, so we can see here that the incident light gives photon energy of twice the work function of that metal surface all right great it says now which one of the following represents the maximum kinetic energy maximum kinetic energy all right uh, in joules of the photoelectron because an electron that is ejected is called a photoelectron okay of the photoelectron uh, ejected from the metal by this photon all right so is it zero well is it half of the energy ah uh, is it x maybe yeah well the best way is to just calculate we know that energy of a photon equals the work function plus the kinetic energy so ek max all right now what is the energy of this photon it is 2x right equals the work function of the metal was just x plus ek max okay now to solve here therefore it follows that your ek max is going to be 2x minus x which is just x so you can work it out but you would also know that well for you to get any photoelectrons out because remember when you have uh, the same uh, energy of your light should i say light or photon if it has the same energy it will just strip those electrons but they will remain on the surface but free they won't be bound anymore but they won't necessarily be ejected but for them to jump out they need extra energy which is kinetic energy so this one is the answer so this is how you work it out again these formulas are very simple this is not n this is w this is the work function okay anyway so you have this formula on your answer sheet so sometimes always try to relate things to those formulae trust me they look insignificant sometimes but they help you on your way so this is how you can get your 10 marks and uh, your 20 marks <laughs> this is how you can get your 20 marks of the mcq section 
so i hope you guys enjoyed that part and let's move on because we've got a lot of work to do now these are the serious questions uh okay not that the mcqs are not serious but these are the questions i tend to enjoy the most over the others all right because here now you're going to be challenged even beyond just the simplicity of mcqs but you can see some mcqs are not that simple okay let's not waste time it says now a man faces difficulty while swimming in a dam all right now the rescue operation um i mean during during rescue operation an inflated tube you know that's what is going to use to that's what is going to be used to help him to flow on the surface all right so at least he doesn't have to to work on that water which is going to tire him and then he ends up sinking so this will help him to not do any work at all all right so that's good okay maybe yeah now attached to a helicopter by a rope is dropped from the helicopter okay no problem so the man of mass 70 kilograms okay holds on to the inflated tube of mass four kilograms all right so we have the mass of the man and the mass of the tube is four kgs while the helicopter is flying horizontally at a constant speed so what does that mean the resultant force is zero please guys this is now more like financial mathematics a lot of things need to mean something to you so this means f net equals zero or the resultant force f rest or f net is zero i don't know if you can see it um I don't know man from this statement it follows that f net equals zero that means there's no resultant force it's just the engine of the helicopter moving without accelerating so it will have the same speed okay so that means there's a balance between air resistance and that engine power okay an average frictional force great so we have lots of things frictional force of 300 newtons exact is exerted okay this frictional force is exerted on the man tube combination okay great so you can see there is the man and that tube so there is friction in that direction remember friction always opposes direction you can see the arrow that tells us about the direction of motion of the man tube and you can already see the direction of the helicopter it's going that way so we're going that way so we're going to take that as positive and then of course the opposite direction is going to be negative which would be the friction all right so it says now um the man tube combination while they are dragged horizontally along the surface of the water by the helicopter okay that was the friction of course the rope makes an angle of 50 degrees so that is our angle theta while the surface of uh, with the surface of the water taking the surface of the water as the horizontal of course uh, as shown in the diagram below now assume that the rope is inextensible and massless that means it does not dissipate any energy okay now it says and the water of the dam does not flow okay that means we're not going to increase the friction all right now here's the thing it says now state newton's first law of motion in words i mean this is easy because i'm dealing with newton's laws so let's have a look at newton's law of motion motion i think i'm already an hour now but let's try and go let's try and go question two of course this is db E May June 2022 Physics Paper 1 Alright, so we're doing question 2 here 
So 2.1, again, it's what is in your textbook. But again, you need to understand these concepts before you can try to formulate words because to cram them, you're going to crash. But when you understand them, you'll be able to pick up the keywords and then just use the English, you know, basic English to just put it together. So here it's just, the first law is related to the law of inertia, right? The body will resist any change in its motion unless the force is external and it is a resultant force. On its own, it just wants to remain at rest or continue in its motion and it will try to resist any change unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force or just say external resultant because once you say resultant it means it's not balanced so don't use balanced and resultant together okay that's tautology anyway so we can say a body will remain at rest or continue in its state of uniform uh, velocity okay my writing is starting to deteriorate again a body will remain at rest or continue in its state of a uniform velocity unless acted upon by an external resultant force. External in that it has to come away or outside this particular body. You cannot use its weight as the reason for this, but there has to be some external force applied. So once you say external resultant force, you are done. Or you can say external unbalanced force, then that's fine. It means the same thing. So that is just essentially the law of inertia. So that is um, an easy to mark. So do you see, if you keep your understanding of Newton's laws of motion, you are on your way to picking some marks, even if the question overwhelms you along the way. So 2.2 it says, now draw a free body diagram of the main tube combination while they are being dragged. Okay, fine. Um, when you do this main tube combination situation here, here's what I know is going to go down. Of course, uh, you start off with that dot over there, which represents the main tube situation. And then we will draw the weight down, isn't it? So the weight of the main tube combination is directed downward. So this is going to be W, which is going to be the main, which is 70, plus that tube, which is 4 times 9,8, okay? At this point, don't worry about um, a lot of things. So always label this thing. I don't know if you have to put the values or not. 70 plus 4 is 74 times 9,8. We used to use 10, you know. Simplify our work, but you guys are, oof, are given something else. So this is 725,20 to two decimal places, Newtons and it's directed down, okay? Next force, what is it going to be? Remember that force is being applied at an angle, so, well, you're going to do that. I mean, here, they don't really care so much about the angles, but they just want to see the force itself. So, this is the tension on the rope. You can just write it as tension, so we don't know this is tension of the rope. All right, great. And what else is acting on this body is the friction. So the friction was mentioned, which is by the water. So this is friction 
which they told us is um, 300 newtons to the right okay I always tend to use arrows for my direction and then of course the tension is up slope so not a problem uh, how many marks are you getting here you're getting uh, four marks so what is the story here? It's one two three so there's one force that is missing and what is that force is the reaction force of the water on the man situation so that is the force that you have there so which is the normal force so maybe that is what you would get so normal force all right but I know for a fact because this motion is going that way there is always a horizontal component of the weight but actually this one um, the horizontal component is going to oppose friction right and it is the driving force so to speak so upper is T X usually T X means horizontal component of the weight and then there's going to be some T Y somewhere I don't know if you have to show these guys but I'm just going all out now and showing you here this is going to be ty which is the vertical component of the weight but remember these two their effect of ty plus normal force is actually in the same direction so these vectors you can just represent them here you can say it's normal force plus ty sort of you can just complex those two because I think those are the most important and of course the horizontal component of the weight is also very important so to show it and write it down then of course that angle there is 50 degrees so I don't know man you can say one two three four meaning normal force plus ty you have to consider ty you can't just throw it in the bean okay if you didn't want to consider it here well you can think about it there but on this free body diagram it's safer to place it here as normal force plus ty and not there because it's acting away from the body but you know you can shift forces to the central focal point so of course if I was you I would do this one of course take that one out but do this one like that and then of course show that angle but show this horizontal component of that weight because I mean of that tension because that's the one that's actually the driving force in essence in that direction of course this is the weight directed down so I mean for this one and that one definitely and then this combination so uh, you know what that tension for marks Whew. Um, yeah what about this one maybe they should have given you five marks but maybe one of them maybe the normal force and that will get you a half and then maybe a half I don't know how it going it's going to go down because for me this is worth five marks because these forces are all here and you can identify them anyway let's go on let us go on so we are good we are good, we are good, we are good. Now, what is the next situation? It says now, calculate the tension on the rope. All right, now, that is some situation that we need to deal with. Now, here's the thing. Now, we're going to use this diagram that we drew because I drew it in this manner so that you can see. Otherwise, you don't have to show this part here. But now it works because for us to work on the tension, what do we know? Constant velocity means this horizontal component of the tension is in balance with the friction. Okay. So it means this is in balance with friction. And that's why there's no acceleration. So this person, this body, what um, what is this called uh, the the man tube thingy is going to move at a 
constant velocity, that of the helicopter in that direction because these two are in balance. All right. So this means friction equals the horizontal component of the tension. And from knowing the horizontal component of the tension, we want the hypotenuse side. So we use cos. The cos. So here in um, 2.3, we're going to say fine. We know that Tx is going to be equal to the friction, which is sometimes called Fx, which is friction. There is in this body tube or say man tube are moving at constant velocity, which is that of the plane, right? Mm. So this whole thing is in balance. But now this is oppositely directed, so we chose to the right as positive. That would mean to the left is going to be negative, right? Great, so therefore our Tx is going to be plus 300 newtons. But sometimes I just write 300 newtons and show the arrow that it's to the right. Okay, so we are good in that we can say this implies what? Now we're looking at this triangle here. Our triangle works in this manner. We are going to have this situation here. Hmm. What is the situation? The situation at hand is that cos 50 degrees, now use trigonometry here, is going to be the horizontal component of the tension divided by the tension, right? And this implies that my tension is going to be the horizontal component divided by cos of 50 degrees, which is that angle the rope made. So let's do it. This is going to be 300 divided by cos 50 degrees. So let's see, 300 over cos of 50 is 466,7. Remember, they say at least two decimal places. This is going to be two newtons. So to two decimal places is like that. So what I have here, this is the tension on my string. But always remember the direction. So here is the direction. There are two ways to write the direction. Um, remember this is west. If you think of the compass, we always measure the direction of our vectors in 2D or in two dimension from north to south. So that means clockwise. So if you measure clockwise, you know this is 90, 180, 270 plus 50. So this is uh, 270 plus 50. It gives us 320. So you can say at 320 degrees. That's done because you measure this clockwise. But you've got options for your direction. Your direction, you can describe it as 50 degrees north of south. So this is written like this. Um, 50 degrees north of west. Sorry, not south. North of west. Okay, you can write it like that. Or you can write that direction as you're starting from the west. So you write W 50 degrees N, meaning you're measuring, you're measuring from the west 50 degrees northwards. So that's how you, you can describe that. Like I said, always make a habit of doing a vector properly because you cannot be asked to calculate a vector and then you don't account for its direction. All right, not a problem. So what is the story? That is the story right there. 
that is the story that is the story and that is the story remember this answer is never complete without direction so however you write it 50 degrees north of west is fine uh, or from the west 50 degrees northwards or you just use the proper one which is north to south so we're going clockwise so you're measuring it clockwise so that is exactly how you answer that question so that's how you get your four marks vectors don't take any chances they are important to keep just that way all right guys so let's not talk too much time is not on our side okay so let's see here it says now um how will the answer in question 2.3 a change if the helicopter accelerates while dragging the man okay the frictional force and the angle between the rope and the surface of the water remain the same now it says choose increases decreases no change the reality is it will increase okay because with acceleration that would mean more force because the horizontal component is also going to increase and that would mean the horizontal component is going to be bigger than the friction because they said the friction remains the same here so that would mean now there is a resultant force horizontally meaning the horizontal component of this uh, tension would actually increase and would be more than the friction and if the horizontal component increases, we know that that directly will increase our tension because from our formula, if you increase the numerator, you are effectively, of course, you're keeping the denominator, but once you increase the numerator, the size also increases. So know also how ratios and things are. So you can just say here, Fx will be greater than fx which is friction did i say fx tx here oh lord tx will be greater than the friction and therefore the tension will also increase so this is the best way i can put it so i mean i'm just lazy to write it down but i think key here is decrease and a very brief explanation so if you increase the numerator effectively you're going to increase the stuff here all right not a problem let's leave it like that and not complicate our lives in another rescue operation the inflated tube of mass four kilograms okay this tube is back again on our face is dropped now remember this one is dropped alone from the stationary helicopter remember this helicopter is stationary it's not moving so this is like a free fall okay when this tube is falling it's a free fall and it strikes the water at a speed of 16 meters per second and you know that it will accelerate down according to gravity at 16 meters per second sorry to reach a speed or should we say terminal velocity or velocity on the ground maximum velocity um, of 16 meters per second okay well in this case we're going to choose down as positive right because the motion here is mainly downward all right so it says now the tube sinks vertically down to a depth of 8 meters I mean 0 0.8 meters and then rises to the surface the rope hangs loosely meaning there's no tension this means no tension on the string so we are happy with that because we would have to account for the tension now they're telling us now don't worry about the tension it has a small effect so all right not a problem we can take that and run with it <laughs> we can take it and run with it okay let's see what we can do here let's see so 
So you see the man is just on the side. He's not on the tube. The tube is just oops and then comes back up before he hops onto it. Okay. So we just have to forget about this dude for a second. Just for a second. Alright, um now it says calculate the magnitude of the average upward force. Okay? Upward force. So we want the magnitude of the upward force exerted on the inflated tube while it is sinking. As it is sinking, remember there is a force of the water now on the tube that is going to be opposing the direction of motion. That's why it sinks to that maximum distance and then comes back up. Now it says assume, always there's some assumption to be made because these calculations are never exactly accurate but they're just approximations. Okay? So assume that the average uh, upward force is constant for the motion, so meaning it doesn't change. All right. So you can see here now they said, ah, we gave you peanuts. Now it's time to give you some stones here to crack. Okay, so here's the thing. Key to answering a question like this is to have yourself a bit of a diagram. So now all, all of what we did is out because now we are done with this question in this manner. So we're moving on. To the new scenario. Um, the new scenario is a little bit different. So, 2.4. So, we will have, for example, this little thingy. So, remember, there's no tension on the roof. So, this little situation here, the tube is just going down. And then this is the surface of the water. We know that the velocity there is 16 meters per second. Remember we chose down as positive. So the opposite will be negative. Okay. So now as it hits the water here, it hits it at this velocity. And then it starts decelerating because this is exactly what is going to happen. It's going to decelerate to this height on the water which is 0 0,8 meters and because now there's two forces working on this object as it descends down here. Let's just show it for a second. Um, remember this thing as it moves down here. There's going to be the force of the water on the object and then there's going to be the weight of the object pulling it down. So in a way, um, that means if this decelerates, that force is greater than the weight, okay? But you know when someone throws a bag of cement or say something, there's a tendency for the hand to be pulled down until that force equates exactly the amount of that force and then drags it when it overpowers it. So that's why it will sink for a second before it comes up. But we already know that the force of the water is greater than the weight. Why? because eventually this will drag this bag up but as soon as it reaches the surface these two will be equal and that's why it will float. Alright, so now we want this force of the water so I don't know what we're going to call it. Uh, they said the upward force so we can just say F and then we say weight here. So there's two forces here. Um, the weight or let's say F W uh, but if we say W it's going to look like weight. Let's just say F and W. So there's two forces working here. Weight and that force. And that force is greater than the weight because the effective acceleration of this system is not 10. It's not 9,8 meters per second. It's not a free fall in this section. So there's an acceleration of this system. That's what we need. Because once we find the acceleration, we can be able to find the resultant force. Okay? Um, and once we find that resultant force, we can work out what this component would be. Alright. 
So let's not waste time, let's get to the job. Now, all we know here that the velocity is going to be zero meters per second, right? Because once it reaches that maximum, so we can say V final, V initial this time around, because before it changes, it's going to be zero. So that's another thing to consider. Okay, so what do we know? Um, we want the acceleration, right? Because we know the distance. Check, we know the final velocity, we know the initial velocity, so we can use these uh, vertical motion equations. We know that V squared equals V final squared, sorry, I'm just having to adjust to these things, V initial squared plus 2, let's just say AS because it's not exactly G anymore. Um, this now tells us 0 equals, what is this, 16, we said down was positive squared, fine, plus 2 into S which is 0, 0,8 times the acceleration that we don't know. This tells us now that our acceleration is going to be 0 minus 16 squared over 2 into 0, 0,8. And you can see that the acceleration is going to be negative. And we said down was positive, so it's already telling us that, ah, we're going to have that situation. Okay, let's move a bit quicker because I think I am wasting a lot of time. I am wasting a lot of time now talking like it's the end of the world. 2 times 0, 0,8. So what I'm getting here is minus 160 meters per second squared. Or you can write 160 meters per second squared up. So the sign already tells me the direction. So I know I'm still correct in terms of my vectors. Okay, That is the first thing I needed. And now I know what is going on here. Therefore, I can use my Newton's second law of motion that the resultant force. Some people say F net equals mass multiplied by acceleration. But now this implies what? This force must be greater because this force is in that direction of the acceleration. So this one must be greater. So I know it's going to be F minus the weight equals the mass, which is 4 kilograms, multiplied by the acceleration, which is minus 160 meters per second. And this also follows that F minus what is W is 4 times 9,8. Why is it positive? because that acceleration is directed downward equals uh, let's just do this one 4 by 160 I'm getting 640 it's minus 640 so therefore my F is going to be minus 640 plus because this is going to be plus now when it gets to this side let's say 4 times 9,8 uh, this is 39,2. Okay. So that gives me minus 600,80 to two decimal places Newtons. Again, you can tell the sign is appropriate because it already tells me this is in the opposite direction. Or you can write it positive and then you show that it's upward not a problem so I'm still in a good position so here this was a bit of a Newton second law but directed vertically so it would cause you a bit of a situation all right not a problem guys um, so that's fine um, how many marks they said five great so I do feel that doing this guy here would roughly give you two marks. Let's just say the correct substitution here. And that gives us two marks. And of course, identify Newton's second law and substituting and working out some things. And the final answer gives us the total of five marks. So that's fine.
some situations are not going to award you more marks than necessary but it could easily be six marks in physics they like to give you um, the formula and give you some marks on that so guys that is the 17 marks of question two I hope you enjoyed it it was pretty simple not complicated at all all right right so let's move on to the next question so that we don't uh, waste too much time here doing a lot more talking than a lot more working out we've got to work things out man so this is a nice question too usually very tough one believe me but uh, let me not say very tough but can be made tough sort of now question three says a small disc c you can see there is thrown vertically downwards at a speed of 15 meters per second okay not a problem so oh hold on mr macamba what are you saying is vertically upward not downward here okay the speed of 15 meters per second again here you always make a choice if you chose positive as upward then everything that's downward is negative okay so you don't need to take both of them okay at 15 meters per second from the edge of the roof of a building of height 30 meters again this height is important to think about after 0 0.5 seconds now they always have this situation of giving you two things at once and they want to make your brain sweat please don't allow it to sweat there's no need um, where there's a wheel there's a way my, my pants are really disappointing me now all right so that's fine and then a small b now they're saying after 0 0.5 seconds a small ball b which um, is this one okay is shot vertically a small ball b is shot vertically apart from the foot now remember this is not from the same height but from the foot okay from the foot of the building at a speed of 40 meters per second in order to hit disc c okay ignore the effects of air resistance so you can see this ball is sitting right at the bottom and um, this one was thrown from you know there so this is a bit of a situation okay <laughs> it's a bit of a situation so okay fine but once they hit each other we know that they'll be the same distance somewhere out there somewhere you know okay not a problem now what do we know it says now explain the term projectile again easy to max easy to max so let's just try and explain this thing to them um, so this is question three okay so 3.1 we can say a projectile but they just said projectile what is projectile motion so in a way when they say explain project projectile motion or a projectile what i'm going to say is now you need to understand what is a projectile something that is projected either up or down but it only experiences the gravitational force or acceleration and no other forces okay so it's a free fall or it's a free falling body or it's a falling body a projectile is a falling body or it's a free falling body so to speak so let's see we can say a projectile is an object projected upward or downward all right um, Really, what can I say? Uh, it is an object that is projected upward or downward. All right, where 
Okay, let's just say as such that it only will it only will experience um, a downward gravitational acceleration throughout its motion. All right, great. I think that is the best way to go about it. Um, can just say projectile is an object projected upward or downward such that it only will experience a downward. Remember this one is only directed downward throughout its motion. I think that is the best way we can explain this. Again, if you understand, you can just put the words together, but make sure keywords like gravitational acceleration and its direction and relative to whichever direction a projectile may be moving is quite important. But remember, when you're talking projectiles, you're talking up or down because horizontally project, projected projectiles, oh, dog, is a bit of a situation that we do not want to talk about at this point because there you would need things like momentum horizontal momentum or linear momentum to work out what you need to because there's velocities and accelerations there that are either than the weight okay so not a problem so we've done our first two marks easily now it says calculate the time taken by disk c to reach its maximum height okay so we know that ah this disk C is going to go out like that, reach its maximum somewhere there, and then fall all the way down. All right, so we know that the time it takes from where it was projected is going to be the same, I mean, the same time that it will take to come down to the same speed. So you can use that, and then you divide that by two. But what I know is, at the top, V is going to be zero meters per second. I always use that to my advantage. And I know my acceleration, my G is minus 10, ah, 9,8, yeah, 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 you guys use 9,8 meters per second squared, okay? So, I mean, with these three, you know that that formula V equals U plus AT, but you guys using this subscripts is fine. I'm gonna use them. So let's do it, uh, 3.2, 3.2.1. So here we know that V final equals V initial plus GT, G delta T. Hey, there's a lot of things in this formula. G delta T, okay, fine. But now this is zero equals the initial velocity was 15 plus here g is minus 9,8. Please pay attention to that. So one time delta t, okay? Therefore, delta t is going to be minus 15 divided by minus 9,8, which is going to be, uh, let's do this one, minus 15 divided by minus 9,8. So I get to two decimal places, um, 1,53 seconds. All right. Remember, this is a scalar quantity, so no need for direction. It only has magnitude. So a definition of a scalar quantity is a physical quantity that only has magnitude. So we are done here. So they were giving us three marks. So getting the formula, substitution, and the answer, pretty easy. So 3.2.2, what do they want? So now they are saying the maximum height above the ground reached by disk C. The maximum height above the ground reached by disk C. Now let's see what is the story here. 
maximum height remember it's going to be that whole distance you know we're going to add this part which is dirty plus this portion which is what we need to determine now so we know the time it takes to get to the maximum but what if you got it wrong I mean you don't want to use what has a potential to be wrong when you have other options that save your life so my life is saved by this I know that V squared V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2G delta Y is it it because this one will give me a new thingy without this rounded off answer which may cause problems so we know that at the top is 0 equals 15 squared plus 2 into minus 9,8 times delta y. Now this follows that my delta y equals um, minus 15 squared, all right? Because when you transpose and then you divide by 2 times this, so it's 2 into minus 9,8, like that. And you see that this is negative divided by negative. It will give us a positive answer, which makes sense if you made the right adjustments. So we have here 15 squared. Uh, Ooh, two times 9,8. So I get to two decimal places is 11,48. Okay. So I have here 11,48 meters. Remember, this is just the short distance from here to there. Okay. So we will have to add because I set the maximum. Once you hear the word maximum, it means you have to consider that that. So now we can say, therefore, the maximum distance is going to be equal to 30 meters plus 11,48. Okay, let's add 30 there. I get 41,48 meters. All right, so that is the one. Again, they are giving four marks here, so a bit of marks here. Because you get your formula, your substitution, the first part, and the last part. So there's the four marks. So pretty easy as well. All right. So the gloves are not coming off as yet. <laughs> All right, so let's see. What is the story here now? What do they want? Now they are saying here, calculate the time from the moment that disk C was thrown upwards. Okay? Calculate the time from the moment that disk C was thrown upward. So, from the moment that disk C was thrown upwards until the time that ball B hits disk the disk okay so ooh, but let's just do this sometimes it's easier when you picture this you say fine let's say these guys are going to meet over here somewhere let's just say here okay let's just make a line here but we know that that is the spot so let's say the disk will meet the ball right there so approximately the same height okay so what do we know is they will be of the same height okay delta y is gonna be the same and the time to get the delta t is also the same I don't know let's just say delta t is gonna be t and whatever that is we leave it like that okay so if we let the time that these two will be together, we can use the distance as a measure, as a function of time. 
so that we can actually get our time nicely by using simultaneous equations for these two. And then from those simultaneous equations, we'll be able to find the time. And that is all. That is all. So again, you got a question like this in the previous paper, the November paper that we did. So if you don't remember it, please go and find it. It's there in the channel. So you will see that this is more or less the same question, but of course phrased slightly different because the other one, I think um, they were sort of like an opposing motion. One was going down, the other one was going up or something like that at the time this thing was happening. So they like to do that. So, well, we're going to work it out by extracting simultaneous equations here because it just does not help us to think of it any other way. All right, so come on, don't blink my camera. I'm gonna try to move fast so that we can spend this hour fruitfully. Uh, we're going to take a bit of time because I want to do two more questions here so that we do less work that is separated. Okay, 3.3. .3. So now we're going to say here, let the time taken for both disc and bore to hit each other be equal to t. You can use any letter for that matter, but I'm going to use time as t. But you can use x, you can use y, you can use, but remember x and y here are going to be dangerous. So maybe you can use k, you can use a, you can use b, anything. We used to call anything that we didn't know a k method. We just called anything that we wanted to use as a means to an end as a k, and then we worked it out. So now, what is this distance here? We don't know this distance. So this ball will have traveled time t because this is the time this one when this one was released to reach whatever that height is. So we know now fine that distance is what we want to use as our means to an end. So a distance as a function of time will help us to work out the time. So we can say now for ball, let's just say for the disc C, we know that delta Y equals uh, U, okay, let's say V initial delta T, hey, I don't like this delta business though, plus half because I mean I don't know the final velocity there so I can't use the other ones that have a final velocity I don't know the time so I, I'm forced to try this one uh, half g delta t squared okay that is the best formula to use then I know what is the story here the initial velocity was 15 okay now it's going to be t delta t is t okay great plus half into minus 9,8 t squared. Okay, we just made it t, so it's gonna be t squared, okay? Let's just simplify a bit further, 15 t. Now this is going to be minus, so this is four comma something, and 9,8 times 0, 0,5 is 4,9. So this is minus 4,9 t squared. Again, this is just equation one because, I mean, there's nothing we can do further here. So we can say for ball B, delta Y is going to be V initial delta T plus half G delta T squared. Again, because we don't know how far it will be. But now remember, this one was 0 0.5 seconds later. Okay, so this one will travel 0 0.5 less time than the initial one. So this one, it left at 40, so this is going to be 40 into. Now remember, what was the total time? It was t, but minus 0 0.5. So we're going to have to subtract 0 0.5 because this one left only 0 0.5 seconds later. So from the total time, we have to take out 0 0.5. Right, it makes sense plus half into minus 9,8 uh, 
into now what is that is going to be t minus 0 comma 5 squared so these questions can be a horrible situation let's simplify a bit we have 40 t minus this one is going to be 20 here what are we going to have we're going to have minus this one is there is 4 comma 9 into now let's expand the quadratic here it's going to be t squared minus 0 comma 5 minus 0 comma 5 is just 1 so it's going to be minus t and then this one is going to be minus uh, no 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 plus a quarter which is 0 comma 2 5 right right that's what we have so let's simplify further we have 40 t minus 20 so this one is designed to stall your time as well. You lose time only doing this one. So this is minus 4 comma 9 t squared. Uh, um, and I think there's an adjustment that we need to do here. Already we have to consider the 30 here. We have to consider the 30 because remember it's already high. So we cannot forget about our 30. I'm just thinking now. This is really getting to my nerves plus 30. Okay. So don't forget the 30 because this distance you're going to add the 30 to it. Because this one is coming from the bottom. If they're coming from the same height. We would even forget about the 30, but now we have to really consider it. Okay, not a problem. But for this one, we don't have to worry about our 30 because it's incorporated in this. So it's already part of this, so we don't worry about it. Okay, uh, this one is going to be minus times minus is plus 4,9t. This one is going to be minus. Now let's say minus a uh, comma okay 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 four comma nine times a quarter hmm what is that it gives me this one is going to be now minus one comma two two five okay uh, let's clean it up a bit so forty t plus four comma nine is going to be 44,9 t right this is when you're collecting like terms and then 20 and then this one so just simply add 20 to this so it's a negative thing so let's just write this one minus 4,9 t squared and then this one and that one gives us minus 21,225. Okay, great. I think we cannot simplify this one any further. We make this one equation two. But what do we know? One is equal to two, right? It's the same distance because they will hit each other there. So they will be exactly the same distance. So we just simply equate the two. So we have 15t minus 4,9 um t squared plus 30 right because that distance needs to be accounted for since this one is starting from the bottom uh equals what is the story here it's a uh, minus 4 comma 9 t squared plus 44 comma 9 t just doing them in order of their powers um, minus 21,25 uh, 2,2,5 alright um, not a problem um, now what do we do we say this is the same sign as that so like terms will immediately cancel so we are good and then what do we need um, we need to move this one to this side because this is bigger than that so basically all we're going to have here is 44,9t minus 15t equals I'm just rearranging 
So I'm moving this one this side and I'm moving this one to that side. It's going to be 30 plus um, 21,225. Okay. And then we solve here. So 44,9 minus 15 is 29,9 T equals. Here I have 30 plus 21,225. So I have 51,225. Okay, great. And do you see here everything is positive? So my time is definitely going to be the division. Therefore, our t is going to be 51,225 divided by 29,9. Um, which is, remember that was t, so it solved the pain. So divide by 29,9. So I get 1,71. Uh, 1. Seconds. Okay, so that is the total time. One comma seven one seconds. All right. So this is the answer, guys. I mean, you can see it's extensive. So even the six marks here looks ridiculous for this answer. I mean, for this question, it's not the easiest you can think of. But yeah, it works. So now let's see if this is true. Because if this is true. We should get the same distance when we substitute this back into our equations. So let's see what we get. Um, what is my thing now? Um, I know, guys, this is a bit tedious, but I will try to to make sure the next question we don't stay and the other one after that so that at least we can do these five questions quickly in these three hours. I will try. Um, let's see, when we substitute the time there, what do we get? 15 into 1,71, all right? Minus 4,9 into 1,71 squared, all right? Plus 30, okay? So let's see. I'm getting 41,32 meters. So this is effectively 41,32 meters. So let's see if it is going to be the same time. Because if it is not, then this is wrong. Let's see if here we're getting the same thing. So this is 44,9 into... Uh, I mean, you can substitute there if you want, or you can substitute here because we just took it down from there to here, so nothing changed. Um, so let's see here, 44,9 into 1,71 minus 4,9 into 1,71 squared minus 21,225. So let's see. So we're getting pretty much the same. I mean, because of some squares, I think it becomes a bit of a challenge. So the rounding off here is what is affecting it. But I mean, look at it, it's 21. I mean, to the nearest, it's just 41 meters. So that's good. So I think our answer here is fair. It's correct. So let's just forget about other things. So I would say to derive this equation gives you a mark. To derive this one and maybe to even express that you had to make some adjustment in its time. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty important. Um, so three marks over there already. And then to equate the two and work them out is another mark. And uh, the rest is just, I mean, mathematics, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So where do you get the sixth mark? Maybe that one is fair. Uh, maybe this one is fair to write like that. So there's the six marks. Okay, it's a bit scattered. 
uh, because I mean we're not being tested for our mathematics we tested for our applications so the key points are those physical science related issues not necessarily the actual mathematics so this one is a bit of an intense question again designed to terrorize you but we can deal with terrorists just right now here's another terrorizing part um, this one is also a terrorist <laughs> where you have to draw the graph sometimes it can be simple sometimes it can be a bit of a situation so let's work it out nice and easy uh, on the same set of axes sketch graphs of velocity versus time for disk C and ball B okay uh, from the moment that disk C was thrown upwards until B hits the disk C okay draw this what on the same set of axes sketch graphs of velocity versus time okay so keyword is velocity versus time so don't do displacement versus time or distance versus time position versus time or acceleration versus time don't do it okay for disk C and ball B from the moment that disk C was thrown upward okay until ball B hits disk C alright remember these ones are delayed by 0 0.5 seconds so you have to think about that label the graph uh, for B as B and for C as C now clearly indicate the following on the graph so now here there's a set of rules that you need to make sure you are including initial velocity of both okay the time at which uh, ball B was shot upward you need to show it that is time zero for sure the time at which both uh, the time at which uh, disk C reaches its maximum height okay that's also cool the time at which ball B hits disk C again we can deal with that because that's the time we just calculated okay all right um, so what did we find by the way was the time for our Thing it to reach its maximum height it was 1,5 and remember it took how many seconds for them to hit each other much less uh, actually much more remember that one was 1, comma. goodness this is horrible what is this what is that is 1,7 and that means these ones hit each other when this one was already turning down yeah yes that means it reached its maximum and it was on its way down when it happened so that means they must have hit each other here somewhere so this one was already on its way down when it happened goodness this is strange okay cool not a big deal anyway not a big deal so this one had already turned so be careful be careful it's very 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 critical so now <laughs> this is gonna be a very fun challenge I tell you all right so let's see what we can do about this question ish man I'm taking so long to do this I don't like it because I'm afraid of being too slow you know being too slow is not going to fly all right so we know here the distance I mean the velocities are not that big so it's 15 to 40 so we can go in tens all right so again remember you have to accommodate both uh, so this is 3.4 both negative and positive because these are vectors so do not accommodate just one so let's say this is our point here so we're going to say 10 20 30 40 okay maybe i made it too big oh lord why so this is 10 20 30 40 this is zero this is minus 10 minus 20 minus 40 so this is something like this so I made this one too big it's fine it won't hurt 
what won't kill us will only make us stronger all right so so on my time axis so this is time in seconds and then of course you can write I'm going to write V though in meters per second you have to write velocity in full okay you have to also write time in full I'm a lazy guy today so I'm not gonna do that so this is 10 20 I win a man what are you doing now 40 minus 10 minus 20 what happened here? Minus 20, minus 30, minus 40. Always think about that. So in terms of the time, I mean, we can see this thing didn't happen any longer than um, 5 seconds or so. So we can just make this easy on ourselves and say... Um, this is going to be just simply, I don't know if it's going to be correct. Let's just say one, two. Okay, let's not do that. It's not going to work. It's going to be too small. So let's just say two <coughs> represents one. So let's say this is one. Two here, three here. Okay, so we're just going to make this one one, two, three, so that it's a bit more visible. Okay, so that is just three seconds or so. All right, not a problem. Yeah, now this one is also doing the thing that I don't like. Now let's do our graph. So I'm going to represent my graphs with my red pencil. Uh, don't do this. Oh no. All right, let's use the other color. It's fine. While it's running away from me, I'm not looking after it. Now, we know here for a fact that this one starts at 15. So 15 is between 10 and 20, right? So there is 15 meters per second. That is for ball C, right? And it took how many seconds to reach its maximum? Approximately 1,5. So 1,5 is just halfway here. So 1,5, well, it was 1,53. So we know that, look, this one did this because it kept decreasing, 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 decreasing until it got here. 1,5, okay? That was the time it took to reach its uh, maximum because they said we need to accommodate that part. All right, so the time at which disk C reached its maximum height, this is when its velocity was zero. And that time was, uh, let's say, uh, 1,53. Of course, essentially, this is approximately 1,5. All right, not a problem. So that is sorted, so we can call this one safely C. Okay, let's just draw the other one before we call it C. I will. All right, so let's see. That is the story. And now for this one, it started at 40, but 0, 0,5 seconds. Now 0, 0,5. Remember, this is 1, so 0, 0,5. This one was a little bit late. It started here, okay? So let's use another color so that we don't clash. 
we don't want a clash so this one started 0 0.5 seconds later than this guy so it will start here see we'll just start on the fly right there but all you do here you're just going to show a dotted line that this is not part of its motion okay but it started there and then of course remember the gravitational acceleration is the same so all you want is to do this make sure that it is parallel to that okay so let's just draw a line that is roughly parallel to this mustn't be too long because we don't know where this is going to go so what was the time that they hit each other that means the area under the curves must be equal so it took how long? Where is that answer now? I got uh, 1,71 seconds. So not a problem. So it's 1,7. So let's see here. Where could that be? So if this is 1,5. So two units is like 1, 2, 3 four five yes okay so two units here or two little things here represent one so this is five so this is six right six this is going to be seven so it's going to be here okay so this I know that the area under this curve should be somewhere here I don't know when this is going to intercept this line ah doch this is very very dangerous stuff you know okay let me just draw a line so that my life is made simple because this is just a dotted line to show that the time so all I know is that this graph will end here this one must end here. Oh, a bit extensive stuff. So this is now for, for B, right? This is for B and this is for C. Now here's the good thing about it is that um, if you notice here, Maybe let's just do this one like that because we are working on this axis with this color right here. So let's just make this one like that to show that this is not the graph line. And also here, we want to make it a point that look. This is not exactly part of the graph. So the graphs are doing that hmm. this is very interesting interessante so that one was c right okay not a big deal so they said we must show this time this time here is 0, 0,5 okay 0, 0,5 and then this one here i don't know i'm going to project it here this is 1,7 one okay seconds so those values are important because when this one was released and when this one was dropped exactly there so it's nicely shown and then uh, they hit each other at this time and where was this one this one was a bit under this one was a bit under so we want to show all of this line going all the way. Yo, I really am going to give a to the whole I don't know now. I'm going to go to the whole thing. I'm going to go to the whole 
Maybe that's why they said a sketch, but you can see where there is a small triangle here. There is a small triangle there already. So that is the situation here. So what do we know here? We want to find out now. When these guys were hitting each other, what was this? What was the velocity of this ball C? What was the velocity there? Because it's important to know, because it's an important point on our graph. I don't know if it is really relevant. And also we want to know what was the velocity of that one as well there at that time, isn't it? So um, I think I've shown everything though. When they hit each other, it was this time. And you can see that the area under the curve of Lord, uh, hey, so all you need to think about is the area under the curve of the that ball, right? The area under the curve of a velocity versus time graph gives you, um, it gives you, let's get one second to an app, something not correct is happening. I don't like it. Um, all right, um, so the area under the curve should tell us exactly the displacement or the distance. So also the area from there till the time that they hit each other, which is going to be there. It's going to be this small triangle there plus that triangle. So we should get the same displacement if this is correct, but I think this is it. So you can just label it here and say velocity versus time graphs of C and B or B and C. You label it. And then of course you can see that ah, this one starts from zero all the way to that distance which we don't know but I mean it's a sketch so do we really have to care? Ah, maybe we should. And then that one only forms a trapezium. So let's just work out those velocities just for interest sakes, you know, just for interest sakes. So to work out these velocities, you're just going to use the time. So we know that uh, for this one, we want to know that velocity over there. So we know that V final equals V initial plus, del plus G delta T, right? And then the V initial here is 15. It was positive, right? Uh, no, no, no. V final is what we don't know. Um, and um, V initial was 15, which is positive, plus G is minus 9,8. Um, Delta T now is, uh, we know that time, right, is 1,53. No, 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 it's 1,71. Okay, so what was the velocity at that time? Yeah, I'm taking forever, guys, but yeah, you understand. You understand, man. So this is minus 9,8 times 1,71 is what we got. Um, see, it's negative to show that it was already in the opposite direction. So this is great. It makes sense. So this is minus 1,76 meters per second. And we said negative was down because we chose upward as positive. So this tells us that great. This one here is this velocity here. So I'm just going to write it here, minus 1,76 meters per second. All right, so that is great. So let's work out what is that one. 
for this other guy so let's use this color v final equals v initial plus g delta t which v initial was 40 plus minus 9,8 into 1,71 which is the time it took for them to hit each other uh, this is going to be equal to oh, I don't think time is going to be on my side but for it but let's do it anyway so I have 40 plus minus 9,8 times 1,71 so this one is positive, so it's 23,24 meters per second. So you can already tell that this is 23, and it's, you, you can see that this was already below 30. So, so what we know here, we have 23,24 meters per second. Now... Why did I do this? Because I wanted to prove to you that these graphs are accurate in this manner. In that, we have to now think about calculating um, the areas under the graph. So let's do the area of the big one and see if we're going to get that displacement which we got, which is 41,32. So the trapezium is always half, okay, 0, 0,5 times the sum of the parallel sides this is going to be 40 plus 23 comma 24 so this is 40 plus 23 comma 24 okay and that is multiplied by the perpendicular height okay the perpendicular height is going to be 1 comma 7 1 minus 0 comma 5 1 comma 7 1 minus 0 comma 5 sorry which is that distance between those two spaces there so I get something close because I rounded off okay I get 38 comma 26 but I think it's the effects of rounding off so it's very close then let's check this one here so this one is this triangle and that small triangle there so let's see what is that what is that so um, the base is going to be either that let's just use this one it's 1 comma 5 3 so it's 0 comma 5 into 1 comma 5 3 which is that time there to the end okay um, half base times height right the height is 15 and then to that we add this situation the small triangle there is going to be 0 comma 5 times the basal side uh, the basal side is going to be 1 comma 7 1 minus 1,53 okay right and then that is multiplied by the height which is that distance which is 1,76 all right so uh, you know, something is really 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 off oh goodness so we forgot there was a 30 meters already for that one but why is it not accommodating it hmm. in any case to all of this we add 30 remember this is just a graph which does not uh, look at that displacement of 30 so in this one we always have to add our 30 which already gives us what we, we got, okay? So don't forget the adjustment here. But this is correct. It should be fine like this because they are coming from different uh, backgrounds <laughs> if we were to consider the height. So for this one, we add 30 to it. So, yeah. So this is what you would do, guys. Uh, so it's a bit extensive, I know. But pay attention that this one is at 0 at 1,53, which is the maximum. 
uh, when it reached its maximum height and then they they met it each other at this time this is that portion over there so you have two triangles for this one and then you have a parallelogram for that the area underneath for this one needs adjustment with adding that 30 which was that perpendicular height of the building but this one captures that because it came from the ground okay all right guys uh, let me not talk too much so this is five marks so in any case they just wanted the sketch i was just being curious here to see if everything is correct so it is correct because i was just checking it yeah i took a bit of time here so i think you get a mark you get a mark for that and then by indicating the time that they hit each other which is that one comma seven one and then also by indicating the time that this one reached its maximum which is that one comma five three you get the four marks and then by indicating where this one started did they say yes the time at which uh, ball C was shot upward I think it's much more important so this essentially gives us the five marks you know and we take our 20 marks of this question and smile yeah that is a bit of work so these questions can take a toll on you trust me because they chow time to think about what is going on is a bit of a situation that you cannot really control on your own but ah, you just have to do your best okay just have to do your best so let's chase question four fast because I don't think this one should take us any time at all. So question four says, what is meant by an isolated system in physics? So you see these questions here is just basics, basics, basics. So you, you can't do physics if you don't understand the basic concepts. So question four, 4.1, 4 okay, we can say an isolated system what is the definition remember an isolated system is an interaction between one or two or more objects such that there is no external influences there's no external forces tampering with that system so what are we going to say here we can just say first you have to think about a system what is a system it is a collection okay of two or more right but it can't be just one thing two or more objects so that really gives us the word system okay that interact okay with each other all right so it's a it's a it's a collection of two or more objects that interact with each other free freely let's just say freely uh, and uh, freely no man free they interact with each other free from their influence of a net or resultant you can say net or resultant of a net external force okay basically that is the story an isolated system you have to think about defining what a system would be it could be two objects or more that are interacting with each other but this interaction is free from an influence of a net external force or a resultant force okay I think that is the best way to put it in just a few words two marks like I said understand what is meant by something then put it together using your simple English 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 okay so great so they started us with some idea about an isolated system once you get this word you know you are going to talk about conservation of something right during an experiment a rocket of unknown mass so we don't know the mass is mounted on a toy cart okay so they are a system see system it's a collection combination okay uh, is mounted on a toy cart of mass 20 kilograms so 
the cut itself, the toy cut is 20 kgs. The cut rocket combination moves at a constant speed. So they move together at two uh, comma sorry two comma five meters per second. So I'm going to choose to the right as positive. Okay. Remember with all of these kinds of questions you need to choose the direction along a horizontal floor. Now it says at a certain instant the rocket is fired horizontally in the direction of motion, so in that direction. So you can see that combination was moving like that and then this one oops got fired and then it went a bit faster than the cut itself. Now it says okay at a speed of 30 meters per second so this is the speed of the rocket and they indicated okay as a result the cut slows down to a speed of 0 0,6 meters per second as shown in the diagram. Now again ignore effects of friction now we can see the diagram before and after so we don't need to make a sketch they already did it for us so they are simplifying our lives since they gave us a bit of a situation in the previous two questions now it says use relevant physics principles to explain why the firing of the rocket will slow down the cut by the way this is just newton's third law Newton's dead law, let's not say of what, because all is going to happen once this cut fires that that way, that one also will apply a reaction force back. And remember, initially there was no force because that was horizontal speed, right? So the net force was zero. But now it tells us that there is definitely some force now that is being applied by this back in there. So, I mean, just say, according to Newton's dead law, when the cut fires the rocket, it applies a force which the rocket applies back, according to Newton's dead law of action and reaction. So, I don't think I have all the best words. I don't want to waste time on this one. Just know the keyword here is Newton's dead law. And then, of course, if you have an external force, it causes a deceleration. A deceleration will then decrease the speed. Okay. Great. So I hope you understand. Um, that is the story. So not a big deal. And then if you're decreasing the speed, you're decreasing momentum. So that's just the thing. Its momentum will decrease as a result of a decreasing of speed. And the speed decreased as a result of a deceleration. Why? Because of the force of the rocket on the cut according to Newton's dead law of motion or just Newton's dead law of physics. Let's just say of physics. <laughs> of physics. Because, I mean, there's no need for motion per se, but it applies anyway. Now, 4.3. Now, see, there's a bit of a situation, but it says calculate the mass of the rocket at the instant the rocket was fired from the cut. So here we're going to use linear conservation of momentum because it is an isolated system. So when we say isolated system is because the forces at play here are the forces that are emanating from these two together. It's not an external force. Even though this one is slowing down but the force was part of the system, this one on this one. So the system in totality has not been interfered with but within itself, those are what we call, you know, internal fights, <laughs> intermolecular forces, things like that, all right, if you're talking chemistry. All right, so fine, we're going to use our law of conservation of linear momentum. So 4.2, basically the key word here is Newton's third law of motion. And then here you're going to apply this in momentum by saying, well, according to Newton's third law, when there's an action, there is an equal reaction but directed in the opposite direction. Then you put it into the context and say when the rocket was fired, the cut applied a forward force on the rocket that caused the rocket to accelerate in the forward direction. But the rocket gave the same amount of force as a reaction force to the cut directed up in the opposite direction and that will cause the cut to decelerate and due to deceleration it will lose momentum because the velocity will decrease. Done. 
I mean, I don't want to say too many words now, okay? 4.3, let's just leave it at that for now. I'm tired. All right, so now we know that, well, here we're going to say P before equals P after, because this is momentum collisions. So what does this imply? It implies that the mass as a system is going to be, uh, the rock is going to be 20 kgs plus the mass of the rocket, which we don't know, I'm going to write it a mister, multiplied by their velocity, which was the same, right? So their initial velocity here, uh, let's just say V initial so far and not complicate our lives. And then P after is going to be 20 kgs multiplied by V of the cut, right? Maybe I should have said mass of the cut here. MC multiplied by mister. Let's just do MC here alone and it's VC plus M rocket multiplied by V rocket, okay? Maybe it's better that way, spare that. I did a bit of a dirty job there. I apologize. So the MC here, mass of the cut is 20 plus mass of the rocket, which we don't know. This is multiplied by their initial velocity, which is 2,5, which is positive because we chose forward as positive. And then this equaled 20 multiplied by, now this is 0, 0,6. It was already in the same direction. Plus here, the mister, which we don't know, multiplied by 30 meters per second. So we just work this out nicely. So here we can see uh, the best thing to do here. Um, okay, let's just do this thing properly. We'll just work it out like a quadratic. I could just I could just easily distribute this throughout and just divide by two comma five. Then it already simplifies your work. But let's just do it the quadratic style. Two comma five times twenty. 50 plus 2,5 mr. Okay, this is supposed to be m. I don't know, maybe I'm too tired now. Uh, 20 times 0, 0,6, I get 12 plus 30 mr. Okay, now I can see here, I can just transpose the 12 to that side. This implies that I have 50 minus 12 equals. 30 mr minus 2,5 mr. All right. Um, now, what does this mean? Okay. F Oops. This is going to be 38 equals. Um, see here, 30 minus 2,5 a when 2,5 is uh, 27,5 mr. Therefore, my mass of the rocket is going to be 38 divided by 27,5. Let's see, what is that? 38 divided by 27,5. Uh, I get 1,3. 38 kilograms. Remember that is the mass. So it's going to be in kgs. So that is simple. Not a very complicated calculation. Uh, so again, they're giving five marks here. I think that formula is cool and to represent these ones like that is fine and then the substitution and then the answer, I think you can get two marks here. Where is the other mark anyway? Oh man. Ah, maybe you can loosely give it anyway. Or maybe putting that this is a scalar quantity. So putting the SI unit is fine. So there's your five marks. Very easy. Okay, here you got your two marks, guys. So you walk away with just how many marks here? Nine marks. 
So this one is an easy nine marks. Usually, the question on momentum, linear conservation of momentum is much easier. So please guys, don't fluff it. It's very easy. You want to fluff other things that are much more difficult than this one. All right, here comes a little bit of a painful one as well, but uh, work energy theorem is pretty okay as well. But yeah, you, you, you just have to work with it. So let's just do this question five and hope that everything works well. Okay, question five says, arrest our beds. Oh, this is about the roads, so... Now, when I first saw this thing, I couldn't understand what it was. But anyway, I thought about it. Arrest. I mean, it arrests something. And um, uh, I was first exposed to this one when I was driving down Kai Bridge from East London. So there's a lot of arrest of beds there. So if you don't know what it is and you happen to be in the Eastern Cape, you can see that. But in any case, any road that goes down and incline, you will see a lot of arrested beds. And I'm wondering why, when you're driving down from Maritzburg down to Mkomaze River, that place is very steep, man. And buses and trucks, they may lose brakes, and what then? I never saw a single one, and they should be thinking about that. Uh, it is the same way when you're approaching from the side of Kokstad down to Mkomaze River, it's still steep there. It's like driving down into a valley or a canyon so anyway it's fine the road builders know why they don't do it let's just not talk nonsense anymore i'm, I'm a bit fried <laughs> hey let's see these guys were having a bit of fun but it was a bit of a a punching fun you know fun that is not exactly fun because your problem here is your time management at the same time to think about these things how they're linked together can be a bit of a situation but hey you've gotten used to it by now already this is all you do you guys so you don't have other things to worry about don't worry about other social issues they don't matter man just do your thing studies are more important because they can change even your current state of socioeconomic status so but if you don't take care of your education those things are only going to escalate. As you can see, even if you're working, man, bread is more expensive than it was when we were small. But if you think about it, though, nothing has changed, honestly, because, I mean, people didn't earn so much money back then. So if you actually approximate these things, it's pretty much the same. The more they increase your salary, the more they raise these prices so that it effectively does what it would do back in the days. Because, I mean, if you're working, a decent job will only get you bread, butter, and some few items at home, which is the case, which was the case back in the days. You know, it's a matter of just knowing how to use what you get. Nothing has changed. That's all I can tell you. Because whenever they raise the prices, they know that they will increase the salary. So the effect of increasing your salary doesn't really mean much because you're pretty much in the same state. Whatever you could afford back then, you're still going to afford it. But manage your money well, okay? Because there are a lot of problems with increments of everything. There tends to be more costs than, you know, an equalization of the situation. So all I'm saying, guys, please, please study more than you socialize if you are a student, especially doing metric. And even when you get to university, do not be the guy who sees everybody in their rooms or walks around going to parties. Just do your thing, man. Especially if you know you're coming from a very, very, very disadvantaged background. You have nothing to fall back on. So already taking that step forward is already an enough pressure for you to fail because everyone is looking down on your situation. You're also very pressured to make it because you just can't go and then come back empty-handed, you know? So it's already enough pressure to take that step forward. So just make sure, man, you take care of your business. And once your business is in control, you'll feel it inside. 
you won't even panic when it's around exams or things like that so that means you can have a bit of a social life because you also don't want to be socially uh, disadvantaged because you still need to interact with people so you need to know how to form good relations with people healthy relations of course don't have these toxic ones even when people are not really your best kind of people you don't like them they don't like you there's no need to be enemies just give them their space and also claim your own space and that's it there's no need for negativity or animosity you know yeah, man. Okay, I was just taking a breather, man, because I was feeling a bit hoo hoo. Put against the wall. Those questions were working on my mind. So please, guys, also double check these answers when uh, your memorandums come up. But here's the thing my sole goal and intention of making these videos is to give you how you plan your attack on these questions, you know. The answers purely are going to be a matter of how vigilant you were in handling your numbers and handling your signs if signs are of importance this is when you're dealing with vectors so you need to worry about signs a little bit more so how you handle signs is what makes the difference how you handle numbers is what makes the difference some implications of certain statements is what could really throw you off otherwise an approach will guarantee you that you get some marks out of whatever situation transpires so that is my main goal at this point we will do some polishing as we go along where then i can say i mean by the time you do your trial you should be now uh, moving away from just you know focusing on approaching questions and you know trying to get something out of every question even if you don't get it but now this is the time to maximize on the marks because this is your last chance for practicing the next one becomes the final, where it matters the most, okay? So please, do your thing and do it fast, okay? This was started by this statement. Arrestor beds are used to help moving trucks to come to a stop when their brakes fail, okay? Instead of causing accidents. As much as there's an arrestor bed in that road I, I spoke about, trucks always fall there because these young people they just drive and not adjust the speed accordingly so you just drop those things you find that there's always a truck that has fallen in that part of the road anyway the driver of a 30 kilo i mean 30,000 kg truck driving down a steep road drives onto an ascending arrestor bed inclined at 28 degrees okay that is very important because the slope becomes important again do you see they gave you a bit of a slopey newton's law of motion there but in any case it was an angulated tension so now they're bringing it uh, again but this time as a slope okay horizontal so this is horizontal uh, but it's sloped at 28 degrees to the horizontal sorry to the horizontal yeah as shown in the diagram so there is a big truck there it's gonna be like oops and then try to stop over there now it's the state the work energy theorem i don't know how many times this question is asked when it comes to this question pretty much almost every exam has this question so you just need to know again what do we know it says the net work done on an object is equal to the change of that object's kinetic energy that's all so question five okay let's seal this one first uh, 5.1 so we know that uh, the net so in any case we just uh, w n equals that's all so just put it in words now net network done on an object is equal to that objects change in kinetic energy okay yeah that's I mean just put it simple 
two words. The key word here is network done and the change in kinetic energy of the object. That's all. Uh, that's easy. That's why I'm writing it. <laughs> Otherwise, I would not. My brain is already not in the mood. All right. So now we are told here a few more details. The truck with failed brakes passes point A at the beginning of the arrestor bed. Okay at a speed of 30 meters per second so you know that once you are given speed so this velocity here initial is 33 meters per second not squared sorry meters per second so that already speaks about the kinetic energy it came with okay and um, it says now the average frictional force is 31,000 newtons while the truck moves up the arrestor bed. So we know that Fx, the friction here, is directed that way. So Fx is going to be directed that way. And then of course the engine is moving at in that direction. So, well, ach doch. But is there any force going that way? Not really. There's no driving force, it's just the momentum, basically, that is moving this thing that way. So we know that the friction is going to be directed downward, fine. And um, the weight of this object is going to also have something to do, but we'll just redraw a, a sketch of this. Okay, fine. Up the rest of it. So we know that at some point the truck will stop, right, where the velocity is going to be zero. So V final should be zero meters per second and that is when the truck will stop okay great no problem um, okay so it says now ignore effects of rotational effects of the wheels okay that means the friction that will be generated by the wheels and all those things the energy conversion from you know when you're screeching the brakes the sound as well as heat when you're applying these brakes and stuff like that so they will dissipate some of this work on this. So they're saying just ignore those things. So there's no dissipation of this work. Once you ignore something, think of it as an isolated system. With only these things that are included. But remember, it's not exactly isolated because there are some external forces like friction and stuff like that. So, yeah, whatever, man. So it means you just are creating an isolated like system although it's not exactly isolated all right give a reason why the network done on the truck give a reason why the network done on the truck while moving uh, on the arrestor bed is negative why is that work done negative the reason is because the forces that are acting on this truck as it's going up the incline are against motion right is friction plus the parallel component of the weight is directed downward and that's all so it's because the forces are in the opposite direction of motion of the truck that's all so let's just answer it here you can say the forces the net forces working net forces doing work on the truck are directed in the opposite direction of motion of the truck. Wow, I can go. So basically the reason that the work is done, because the net work done here, the net forces at play are exactly opposite the direction of motion. And that is all. Don't complicate it. There's your one mark. Now it says use. Now you see here, they always dictate here. Use energy principles to calculate the minimum length. Okay. Of the arrestor bed needed to bring the truck to a stop. Okay. So that's fine. We can deal with that. Because if they are dictating, please don't use any other option. Because you are being told what to use. So don't do your own thing because there's a way of doing this without using these energy principles. But now they are forcing you because this is the chapter 
that you are in. So they want you to do chapter specific manipulations. Otherwise, if they didn't care, they could easily let you do whatever you could, like force diagrams, like dealing with forces and uh, Newton's laws of motion. So they don't want that here. So I'll show you how you could have used Newton's laws of motion and some force diagrams to deal with this. Okay, so great. So five marks. So again, this is one of the very best marks you can get because the question is usually easy to handle but it needs you to understand a few things so let's have a look at this so let's consider our track going up this incline this is the horizontal so it's at 28 degrees right 28 degrees i don't know why that is so small now let's imagine our track in this region right here Okay, but this is throughout its motion anyway. We're just going to do a free body diagram. We know the weight of the track is going to be directed downward, right? But there's going to be a vertical component of the weight that is going to be directed perpendicular to the slope, right? That's why we say the perpendicular component of the weight, and it goes like that, but perpendicular to the slope. Then there is a horizontal component of weight, but we're going to drag it down here so that we have a tail-to-head method, this weight becoming the resultant because that's the guy actually at work. These are just components of the weight. So we say weight parallel or parallel component of the weight. So this is parallel to the slope. And the angle between these two is always 90 degrees because this is parallel to the slope so you know corresponding angles should be like that now how does the way the weight affect the motion by its vert i mean parallel component because the vertical component is perpendicular to the direction of motion so it does absolutely zero work but because this angle is funny it's not exactly in line so now we always take the component of the weight that is you know in the direction of motion so that means here we're going to have the frictional force which is what was there plus the horizontal I mean the parallel component of weight so both these forces are directed down slope so they will add together to give us the net force okay no problem and we know here that the velocity at the beginning was 33 meters per second and at some point this velocity which is final that was v initial so this is v final is going to be zero meters per second so that is what we know okay but we know that the, the way this slope is angulated is exactly the angle that is going to be between the weight and its perpendicular component so that angle there is going to be 28 degrees so this is the sketch you need to have in mind. So all we need is to calculate this uh, parallel component of the weight because it works together with the friction to stop this track. There's nothing else, okay? Because it doesn't have brakes anymore. So even if you switch the engine off, we'll just assume the engine is off because that's the first thing you want to do for this to stop. You don't want the engine to continue pushing this track. So the guy's gonna switch the engine because he can't use the brakes anymore. So that whenever now the weight of that truck starts to have effect as it moves up, then the truck can come to a stop. Otherwise, if you're still running the engine, then you're not helping yourself because it's just gonna move through that thing. All right, and you're causing yourself injuries. All right, so there's no problem. So the first thing here, we want the parallel component of the weight. So. We will start then, say W parallel is going to be equal to, I mean, there's a very simple way. So, I mean, you look at this as a right angle to triangle. So I'm not looking for the vertical component because it doesn't do any work here. But the weight works with its parallel component. So to find this one, I have to use sine of 28 degrees because this part is opposite that angle. And I know the hypotenuse is the weight, so which is fine. So I know that the parallel component, uh, okay, let's just start 
by using trigonometry easily. The first thing is to say sine 28 degrees equals v par I mean w parallel over the weight. So I'm looking for this one. So all you do is just cross multiply because that is over one. So it leaves our v, I mean w parallel. I don't know why I like this v parallel. It's going to be the weight multiplied by sine 28 degrees. So some people already know this is the case. But I always want you to have a way of working things out if you forget because there's no way you can cram how this can be. This slope could easily be turned that way. So certain things may have to change depending on what you're looking for. So please don't make a mistake of let's say for example the force applied here is pulling this thing on a slope but also is at an angle to the slope now you'll have to think about that vertical component of that weight or of that force and you know things like that so don't cram just know how to work things out just use simple trigonometry and then derive a nice formula then you can substitute what is w is going to be the mass of the truck multiplied by gravitational acceleration times sine of 28 degrees what was the mass of the truck it was 30 kilo i mean 30000 kgs multiplied by 9,8 so don't use a sign here remember doing work energy don't do any so in this case don't do this because the motion is not exactly vertical but it's sloped that's why we're taking a component of the weight because that's what has effect in that direction of motion because this downward thingy does not really directly play there it indirectly works with its parallel component oh here i am talking forever sine 28 degrees so let's do that one because that's what we need to start our thing so let's start with sine of 28 it is what i Get, and then we multiply this by 9,8 and then we multiply this by 30,000 and I get 138,024 to two decimal places at least that's the minimum is going to be 6 even if I wanted 3 but it's gonna be 6 3 let's say 0 newtons okay because minimum 3 but 3 in this case you'll have to take 1 from 5 and 8 it makes 10 and then that's exactly what you're going to do why am I saying 3 0 now 4 0 man come on sir this is 1 3 8 0 oh, 2 4 comma six four zero newtons always when you are going to do an intermediate step at least take it to about three to four or even take it all as it is because it will affect your answer negatively when you round off early all right so that is what we want because now that we have it we can use our work energy theorem so we can say Network done is going to be the change in the object's kinetic energy. Right, but now what is the network being done? Because we want the distance that it will take to stop. Of course, this distance is from the beginning all the way to the time it stops. Okay, don't make the mistakes of taking it from there. I was just picturing this on the slope, but it starts there and it ends there. So what should be this distance of the arrestor bed that we need? So what is doing the work here is the friction plus the parallel component of the work, okay? So here we're going to have here Fx, which is friction, multiplied by delta x. x means the distance, right? Cos theta plus there's two forces at work here the parallel component of the weight is w parallel times delta x because it's also acting over the same distance cos theta all right equals what half 
of the mass into v final squared minus v initial squared, right? That is how EK works. So I'm just trying to work a bit faster. I am getting a little bit tired now. I feel like a zombie. Now, remember, that friction was what? Uh, 31,000. They told us that the friction was 31,000. Multiplied by delta x. I don't like this delta x. We used to use the symbol s for displacement or distance. Times cos. What is theta now? Remember now this theta is in relation to the direction of motion. Remember the motion is that way. But this force is acting down. So it is at 180 degrees to the direction of motion. So this is 180 degrees. Plus... What is this force? We calculated it there. It's 138,024,640 times delta x cos. Again, this force is acting at 180 degrees to the direction of motion, 180 degrees. Equals half. What is the mass? Is 30 thousand okay multiplied by v initial is zero minus uh, I mean v final is zero v initial was 33 squared okay great so this is a bit of a very long thing that is very tiring at its best so here what I can do I already know that cos of 180 is minus 1. So already here what I'm going to have is minus 31,000 delta x minus because this is also going to be cos of 180 is minus 1. So this is going to be minus 138,024,640 delta x equals. Let's just deal with this one. And you will see that this is negative, right? So we have here uh, 0, 0,5 into 30,000, right? Into uh, 33 squared. I'm just going to put it like that. And then let's see. Yo, yo, yo. I get sixteen million three hundred and thirty five thousand uh, joules. Of course, this is negative because of this negative. Remember the square, there's this little bracket over there. Yeah. So this is minus that. Okay, joules. So don't worry about the units so far. Now what do we have here common is delta x. So still quadratics or factorization. So we will just have minus 31,000 minus 138,024,640 equals minus 16,335,000. So therefore, delta x is going to be equal to minus 16,335,000 divided by that sum. What is that? So let's say minus 31,000 minus uh, 138,024,640. Uh, Ah, uh, I think I'll clear. Minus 31,000 minus 138 and 24, 640. Yeah, So this is minus 169,024, 640. So they wanted the displacement, so it comes out nicely here. So we have minus 
Divide by minus 169,024,640. So I get 96,64. So this is 96,64 meters. That's the answer, okay? So this is easy again. But it's going to take you to be very vigilant because it has a tendency to have big numbers and signs also are a bit important even though we're dealing with scalar quantities there's vectors included here so that's why signs also become a bit of an issue so five marks again here i think you know recognizing that this is the case up here you can get two marks for that one, all right? Then you get a mark for this, right? For the formula. And you get a mark for this whole substitution over here. And you get a mark for the answer. So there's the five marks, okay? So let's end this pain as fast as we can. I don't know, man. Everything is just, you know, moving like crazy. So I hope you were able to follow. So that's all. Now I said to you, you can use Newton's laws of motion here to, to address the situation, but remember you are not allowed. You're not gonna get marks if you used Newton's laws of motion. Or at least I believe they should not give you marks because that's not how they wanted it, right? The manner in which they wanted it, you had to use energy principles so that is the work energy theorem now if you wanted to use newton's laws of motion i'm just going to show you because this is the last question now remember again you're going to consider this truck moving only in that direction because of those two forces the friction and the parallel component of the weight so it's going to be moving from that point to that point so this initial velocity was 33 meters per second there is zero meters per second okay so what do you need here you know that the resultant force using newton's laws of second motion is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration those forces is minus because they are in the opposite direction of motion it's going to be minus 31,000 minus this one that you got so you, you can't escape this diagram in that calculation minus 138 and 24,640 equals the mass was 30,000 multiplied by the acceleration therefore our acceleration here is going to be negative it's going to be those together which is minus 31,000 minus 138 and 24,640. So I get minus 1690,2464 divided by 30,000. All right, so what is that? So let's divide this by 30 squared. I get minus 5,6. Three, uh, when six three four meters per second always try to take three because you don't want to round off too soon into the final answer now once you have the acceleration you want the distance you have the two velocities you use this formula v squared v final squared equals v initial squared plus two a s ah uh, two a delta x okay use that and when you put it together here, you will solve for this. You will get exactly the same answer. So, but you, you're not allowed to use this. Please don't do it. Once the question dictates, like I said, pay attention to local rules. If you don't, you bend those rules, then you are committing suicide, okay? So that's how it's done, all right? So, fine. Now the last question says, the diagram below shows the same truck entering a descending arrestor bed inclined at 28 
degrees to the horizontal. So this time it's a different situation and it's coming down. Now it says the initial speed of the track and the average frictional force on the track are, sorry, 30, okay, it's the same as up, I mean, as in the first scenario, okay? But remember, friction is going which way? Friction is going that way, okay? And the unfortunate thing is that the weight is directed ex directly down. But what is going to happen here? There's going to be the vertical component of the weight. That is W vertical. But it will also have a horizontal component. Or should I say not a horizontal, but a parallel component of the weight parallel to the slope. So you'll have that tail to head method. So you will still have that angle as 28 degrees over there. So, but now what force of the weight is involved is this guy. So now do you see this guy? Because we have our weight over there. This guy now has what? This force, which is the parallel component of the weight, also pu pulling this truck down. There's only one force now opposing, which is just friction. Okay, so this thing is going down and that one is trying to pull alone, okay? Mind you, this came with the momentum of the engine acceleration and stuff. So there's more forces now taking this truck down than trying to stop it, okay? So it says now, uh, which arrestor bed, ascending or descending, will be able to stop the truck in a shorter distance? Obviously, is the ascending one. Because in the ascending one, we had two forces, friction plus the parallel component of the weight trying to stop the truck. Okay, so it would take shorter because two forces against none is better. But now, okay, that's fine. Explain the answer in terms of the forces acting on the truck, as you can see. So there's only one force now opposing the motion, which is the friction. So mind you, with an extra force that is pulling in the direction of motion, it will take longer to stop this truck, all right? So basically, that is the case. So in the ascending, you're going to say in the ascending, there's two forces opposing the motion of the truck. Is the parallel component of the weight plus the frictional force. And therefore, the truck will take a shorter distance because there's the net force is opposite the direction of motion. But in this case, uh, the situation is that there's two opposing forces here now at play. The friction against the vertical, com I mean the parallel component of the weight. So this friction will have to take time to really expand that weight uh, component. So that is what you can say. So for those three marks, I think that's essentially how you're going to phrase that. I think I'm lazy now to put it into words. So you can just put it into your own words yourself, okay? Ah, doch, let's just do it. Ascending. The ascending arrest a bit. You can just say there's two forces opposing the motion of the truck. And so we'll take shorter distance to stop. In the descending one, there's only one force opposing the motion of the truck and will take longer to stop. I think that is the best because they said refer to forces acting on the truck. So again, to stop this, you need to oppose the motion. So when you have two forces, it's much better than when you just have one. So it's just simple. So you just have to state those two scenarios and then you get your two marks, one mark, then three marks. And then you walk away with the 11 marks of this question. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know I took a bit longer than I wanted to. Even to upload it is going to be a bit of a situation. But I just didn't want to do too many 
small parts so I hope you can bear with that three hours maybe it's almost three hours that you're going to take to watch this video but I'd be happy it is less than three hours because at least it's my usual long period of doing these videos and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much guys for your patience to listen to me talking a lot of nonsense alongside trying to assist in your approach to cracking physical science as well as mathematics because these are my two favorite subjects that I did very well in my metric year as well and mostly I had to do this all by myself and there wasn't so much access to videos like this and to many books that you can find we were very limited even at the school there wasn't so much to go on by so you just had to use your head more than to have a lot of resources around you so you guys have a variety of tutors you know friends you can even make friends with people in Cape Town while in Johannesburg you can share information share ideas share videos of how to solve some tough questions you see guys we have a lot of things that can help you which we didn't have because even the phones were like those 33 tens that was the best phone at the time <laughs> so you know these phones with uh, i think motorola at the time came with that uh, flipping phone so uh, that was the one that was a bit better but again I don't think it was possible to do pictures on those phones I mean, so, and take videos as well so it was a bit of a situation but hey we made it work okay so you guys have more of the advantage please do your best don't give up don't take these things that you are just going to you know magically understand them you need to take your books sit down work through your book every single question remember in your book it's 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 graded from you know very simple to a bit more complicated and then once you've reached those complicated ones then take the past exam question papers because now this is what you're going to face pretty much then try to fiddle your way through you're not probably gonna get it right initially but you'll be able to follow because you understand what you're doing okay then of course there's videos like this one so where we can try to integrate everything at once at the same time trying to tackle these very challenging exam questions i hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you really liked it you can give it a thumbs up and also subscribe or consider subscribing uh, because i can assure you i'm going to keep doing what i am doing here to give you more and more so that you can see that these approaches are bulletproof and they are within your reach they're actually what is at your level which is metric level so i've not used any advanced methods here in these videos of course i will state when i have something more than the level of metric but even there i will always parallel that with what is relevant for your curriculum so that you can see that ah, even what you know is still very useful but sometimes maybe a bit challenging to figure out this is when I would introduce something a little bit maybe higher level than metric level but I mean maths is maths right physics is physics nothing changes all right guys um watch out for the next video when we can finish this physical science paper so we have five more questions to do the Doppler effect, electrostatics, uh, current electricity, my favorite, and then electrodynamics. Okay, um, the photoelectric cells. So we're going to take them down together at once in the next video. So as a part two. So again, guys, uh, I know I talk too much even at the end of these videos, and I don't want to. But please, guys, uh, practice. Please, guys, double check some of the things I say. I know I'm not uh, perfect, so there will be errors in my judgment. There will be errors also in my understanding of certain concepts. So how I explain them may not necessarily be, you know, what is actually correct, but maybe it may be closer to being correct. So I still stand to be corrected myself. So 
don't take me as someone who knows it all and don't take me as faultless as well but I do give my best to ensure that what I do for you guys is the best of what I can give you and it's not the least of what I can give you and I do my best to make sure that it is sort of like a strong correlation to your curriculum so to speak okay because I am truly not a teacher I'm not an educator by profession uh, but I loved the idea of teaching because even when I, when I was doing metric I taught some of my fellow students went to varsity it seemed to never escape me so I would have some moments where there's someone who needs me to teach them and sort of developed in me to try and you know give a little bit of that spark of teaching which was never really completed but yeah it's there so that's why I do these videos um, all right guys thank you again for your subscriptions I can see they're increasing and rather exponentially and I'm really humbled by that and also to see the views increasing I think one of my videos has reached a thousand so that is also very good because now that means more people can start to see many of these videos and that way a lot of people can also be reached for whatever I have to offer here and then they can look it up and then compare and see if it is really worth you know the trouble and again thank you guys for your assistance in this regard like I said I'm gonna do some sort of mini competitions but I'm gonna give you some very good prices trust me maybe I'm just going to say maybe you're looking at first price maybe something like a tablet but a good tablet of course and then second price maybe you know uh, something less than a tablet but maybe a good phone I don't know and then maybe the last one that price because I'm gonna make it to be three prizes then the third prize will be um, say some study material at least so that we keep it education oriented I don't want to spoil you guys with just giving you things that are just going to distract you and cause you to be lost because with a tablet you can download more study materials download more videos watch more videos I mean you can do a lot of work with that with a phone it does have internet access so you can network with people watch more videos download I mean most, more or less the same thing download materials and stuff uh, study material is just a physical thing you know maybe I'll just put in two study guides one for grade 11 and 12 for one subject and then maybe include a calculator in there like this calculator I have I think this calculator is good you guys I mean it's the best I've seen I had a cash show also during my metric but it was not this good so this is good so maybe I'll put two study guides maybe say grade 11 and 12 if it is mathematics and that calculator if it is physics maybe a similar thing just to encourage you guys to study more of course this may be a little bit too late for you guys but I think it's the best time you know before your trials I think we should have done something like that all right so I will do my best to do it or at least within your trials and there must be something there must be something so that you can see its usefulness before you even go beyond metric and I mean the ones to come can also see what is happening so yeah all right guys for now let's just cut it I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.